Good evening. I'll call the April 18th, 2024 meeting of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Cruz to order. Welcome, everybody. Um, we'll start with the roll call. Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Thompson. Present. Commissioner Dan. Here. Kennedy. Here. Paul Hamas. Here. Gordon. Here. McKelvey. Here. Chair Conway. Here. Do we have any statements of disqualification this evening? Seeing none. We will move on to oral communications. This is the point in the agenda where uh, members of the public are invited to speak to the commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda, but are under the purview of the Planning Commission. Would anybody like to um, speak? Uh, please come forward. It's helpful to uh, let us know your name. And you'll have three minutes. Thank you, I'm Jill Wynn, and as promised in January, I am back to discuss public safety in the planning department. I'll repeat the main points from both my November and January public comments. In November of last year, I said it was our collective responsibility to prioritize the safety and well-being of our neighborhoods and the environment. Mats and Britain, using only the term beige to describe asbestos composite siding on an existing home in my neighborhood, while calling out the existing roofing material as asphalt composite in a public uh, project submission to the planning department was both unprofessional and unconscionable. In January, I provided you with copies of letters and emails I wrote to planning, public works, and the building department prior to plan approval where I outlined very specific concerns about asbestos removal and public safety. And while there were 29 conditions of approval listed on the planning, department, uh, by the planning department, none were specific to public safety regarding the asbestos removal in my neighborhood. I was forced out of my home when asbestos removal began before a building permit was issued and the work proceeded to include a structure outside the permitted scope. At that time, my calls and emails to the planning department were ignored until after the permit was issued. There was no stop work order issued on the project and I was left with asbestos debris in my yard with no assistance from the city. Had the out-of-scope non-conforming building been included in the submitted plans, neighbors would benefit from the opportunity to address, the, to address this commission. I would have had another chance to express my concerns. Months after the mishandling of hazardous material, I called and emailed about a three-foot deep groundwater filled trench spanning the property border into my yard. A stop work was issued. The work stopped, not because my property was damaged or my fence was destroyed or my PG&E gas line was exposed, which it was. Work was stopped for an archaeological survey. In total, there were three archaeological surveys on the 5,000 square foot lot next to my home. The City of Santa Cruz Planning Department seems better aligned to support the dead than someone like me. Something is out of whack if the Planning Commission and Planning Department can spend time reviewing a report on one redwood tree, but citizen reported public safety concerns are unanswered. Something is out of whack if, we work, if work is stopped for archaeological surveys, but not for a reported mishandling of hazardous materials. Please let me know when you would plan to put public safety and project oversight on the Planning Commission agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Butler. Thank you, Chair Conway, and um, sorry to hear of the experience of, the, um, of Mrs. Wynn. Um, I do know that after the um, conversation or, or the testimony that she had in January, our team um, approached her and provided um, contact information to the, um, the IMBARD, the Monterey Bay Area Resources District, mm -hmm. um, and um, then the Monterey Bay Air Resources District um, subsequently because um, that particular project is exempt 
um, referred Mrs. Wynn to um, the um, Cal OSHA Occupational Safety and Health uh, Board. And so uh, this project was finaled in um, November of uh, 23. So um, there, uh, any complaints would go to the Occupational Health and Safety Board and um, that information I believe you have in terms of the um, the yeah I, I can re-forward the email to you good thank you for doing that and thank you for your comments yeah, I do appreciate the comments and um, it, it is uh, something that we take seriously and we are not the regulators in many of those instances um, and so uh, we do seek to, to connect individuals to um, the, the correct regulatory agencies um, it sounds like from from her testimony that maybe that didn't happen at the very beginning um, and in any case um, there uh, we're, we're trying to point her in the correct direction at this point right thank you for that one of the things about the acting as a planning department is um, you're often the messenger for every regulating body and it can be really um, confusing um, if you're a member of the public and you don't deal with this every day um, to know exactly who it is you're supposed to talk to. And I think that's a really important role of the planning department. So thank you for doing that, and I'm, thank you for making sure she gets the information. Yep, absolutely, and, and you're absolutely correct um, that um, we do sort of coordinate with, with county agencies, with statewide agencies, um, you know, Regional Water Quality Control Board, the county health department, and so forth on an ongoing basis. It all looks like it we're, comes from We're the you. clearinghouse <laughs> oftentimes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And any other public comments? Uh, seeing none, uh, we will move on to approval of minutes. We have minutes for, and did, did we determine that we can do them all at once? Um, I would like to request that uh, we move the minutes of March 7th to the May 16th meeting. Okay. Okay. Let's move that on. And we have the minutes of April 4th. And is there a motion to approve? Move approval. And a second? I'll second it. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, those are accepted. And... Uh, we will move on to tonight's business. Um, the Planning Commission tonight will be considering private property outdoor seating project number FP24-0001, amending several sections of Municipal Code Chapter 24 to streamline permitting and establish standards for private property outdoor seating associated with eating and drinking establishments. These chapters are part of the local coastal program implementation plan and will require coastal commission <laughs> approval prior to taking effect inside the coastal zone. And do we have a staff report? Welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Rebecca Unit. I am the economic development manager for the city of Santa Cruz in our economic development and housing department. And I'm here with Singer from our uh, community uh, planning community development department. Uh, so the item tonight uh, is our private property outdoor seating ordinance. Um, these are some proposed changes to streamline the approval process for uh, outdoor seating in our private property spaces. As uh, some background for you um, on how this is uh, coming to you this evening. Um, in 2020, during the pandemic, the city created a temporary outdoor expansion program um, in light of the uh, business closures that occurred um, due to the pandemic restrictions. So uh, we allowed businesses on private property as well as in our public spaces to have uh, free temporary outdoor expansion permits to be able to set up outdoor seating at their establishments. Um, the, through this program, uh, we issued over 100 permits uh, citywide and across the various um, options that we provided. And in the uh, private property space specifically, we had 21 businesses uh, that are still operating with those temporary permits. Um, and we have a list of those businesses here for your reference. Um, 
the city council directed us to work on a transition and ordinance changes to allow these businesses to move into a permanent approval of these expanded spaces. And um, with that, we extended their temporary permits until May 31st of 2025 to enable them to have uh, time to go through the permit process once it's established. Um, to give you an overview of some of the community outreach and policy development timeline that we've gone through um, to come to this meeting this, uh, tonight. Uh, we started about a year ago with the city council subcommittee um, reviewing and discussing uh, the options to look at streamlining these um, ordinances and, and permitting processes. Um, that culminated in an outreach meeting to businesses and community members in September where we presented our initial proposal. Um, and we also opened a community survey to get feedback from the public. Um, following that, we returned to the subcommittee to review the feedback that we received and look at some additional modifications uh, to further streamline it and make this process easier uh, for businesses. We then presented um, our second uh, sort of review of that process to businesses and community um, in March. Uh, and that has led us to the proposal that we're presenting to you uh, today. Um, and if this were to be approved, uh, we anticipate bringing this to the city, uh, to the city council in um, May. So our initial uh, proposal when we presented this um, in September was uh, to reduce the design permit requirements um, and set up some criteria related to proximity to residential, wanting to be um, mindful of some of the potential noise impacts and those other um, parameters. Uh, our existing outdoor dining um, permit approval process currently requires three separate permits, an administrative use permit from the Planning Commission or a um, special use permit uh, if they are high risk or have some other non-conforming uh, uses, a design permit and a building permit. And so we looked at creating some different pathways to have a staff level AUP, uh, administrative use permit and a building permit, or going through the full zoning administrator hearing um, to try to, to streamline that a little bit. Uh, following presenting that um, option, we heard um, a lot of great feedback from the community and the business owners um, asking for us to continue to reduce those barriers to permitting that um, it was still a challenging process um, to approach and looking at ways to sort of grandfather in some of these outdoor spaces. Um, there has been a lot of success over the last almost four years now that we've been implementing uh, the temporary program and also looking at reducing permitting costs and timelines for approval. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, after working with the city council subcommittee, uh, we came to an option that is allowing outdoor seating by right, so not requiring that use permit at all, um, as long as the businesses are able to comply with our operating standards and design standards that are established in the ordinance. Um, but giving an opportunity if businesses did want to deviate from those to be able to apply for that through a use permit or a design permit. Um, and reducing use permit and design permit um, is estimated to reduce the permit cost by about $7,000. Um, we are not able to reduce the building permit requirement. That's always required for private property development. So that is a step that um, you know has to remain in effect. But we did look at ways to potentially find some additional streamlined pathways for approval um, if it works for the business uh, and their goals. And so looking at trying to provide an hourly review uh, if the outdoor seating space is up to 300 square feet and over that would go through our standard review process. Um, this chart is a little bit small on this slide, um, but this is just sort of a breakdown of sort of where a business would qualify between the two processes. Um, so the square footage threshold is the real uh, main criteria, uh, but then also looking at if someone were to include an overhead structure, like a patio cover, an awning, something that is fixed um, that requires more of that structural review, that would go through our standard review process. Um, or those are sort of the major differentiators in that in those two processes. Okay, I'm gonna, oh, excuse me. I'm gonna um, take a little bit of time to talk about the operating standards and the design standards that we have in the ordinance. So again, if you want to, if a business wants to um, move forward without a use permit, they can do so by complying with all these 
operation standards. If they want to deviate from one of these, they would need to apply for a use permit. And then for the design standards, if they meet all the design standards, they just sail through with a building permit. If they want to do something different from the design standards, then they would apply for a design permit. So for operating standards, the overall purpose of this is basically to make sure that the business is going to, the use is going to be compatible with the surrounding area, any other businesses or residences in the area. Um, with regard to um, alcohol-related um, um, standards, um, the ones listed in the ordinance are uh, basically the same as the types of conditions of approval that are applied um, as a standard on alcohol use permits. Um, in this case, they're just listed as standards and not conditions of approval. Um, and then some of them are augmented a little to be specific to the outdoor seating area as opposed to like a, the indoor restaurant. Um, for hours of operation, uh, we have those at 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Sunday, um, and that is, uh, reflects the hours in the city's noise ordinance. So that's um, completely compatible with that. There are security and maintenance measures um, that would require security cameras, security lightning, lighting, excuse me, <laughs> maintaining a trespass letter with the police department, um, and requiring the seating area to be closed when the business is closed in order to prevent trespassing um, or criminal behavior. Um, so these safety standards were all reviewed by the police department, um, and they are consistent with the kinds of standard conditions that we would apply to um, use permits as well. Um, there are also several standards that ensure compatibility with adjacent properties and the surrounding neighborhood. Um, those include limiting amplified sound, um, prohibiting any kind of cooking in the outdoor seating area, keeping the area clean and well-maintained, um, and requiring staff to regularly monitor the seating area and the surrounding area. Live entertainment is limited to the same amount that's already provided in the municipal code, um, which is um, up to three consecutive days and no more than five days total per year. If a business wants to go beyond that, they would have to apply for a live entertainment permit. Um, and then I also um, want to, well, I'm going to get to that later on. There's one thing in the ordinance that, um, that we're proposing to delete, but that's in a couple slides. So I'll hold that thought. Um, and then for the design criteria. Um, the overall purpose of this, obviously, is to have a good design, um, an athletic, aesthetically pleasing view from um, like the public right-of-way, um, and a, a design that's compatible with the site, while also balancing um, with our effort to make sure that the standards are simple and attainable for businesses, that they're not overly complicated or expensive. Um, so, the location of the patio determines how tall or short the perimeter fence must be. Um, generally, outdoor seating area um, fencing that's adjacent to a public space is limited to three and a half feet tall. Um, for example, what you would see in the top left picture here. Um, and that would allow for a good interface with the public space. Um, when the seating area is set further back, a taller fence is allowed. Um, and if it's behind the building, the fence can be up to eight feet tall. And um, those standards are um, comparable to the, stand, the fencing standards that we have in the zoning ordinance, where we require a three and a half foot fence if it's a fence is in the front yard setback. And if it's in the rear, it can be up to eight feet. If it's in a side yard setback, then it can be up to six feet with a little bit of setback for landscaping. So those types of things are all built into this to reflect what we already have in the zoning ordinance. Um, so um, clear windscreens are allowed for um, fencing near a public space. So if you're near the public right-of-way and you want to have a windscreen, you can do that. Um, but in that case, the fence must be set back three feet from the property line with some landscaping between the fencing and the public space, and that helps to um, kind of prevent this looming thing that's like right next to the sidewalk. Um, and that's, um, that's consistent with what we have for um, exterior side yard setbacks in the zoning ordinance. Um, and then um, furniture is required to be of good quality with materials and colors that are compatible with the associated building. 
Um, overhead structures such as roofs or patio covers need to be durable, permanent structures. Um, if an outdoor seating area has one of these structures, then um, it should have the overhead cover but not have the sides because we don't want to be creating an enclosed room that's outside. We want to have a roof and then an, an outdoor feeling. Um, so we're not creating a new building, basically. Um, and then the outdoor seating area must be lit, um, and the standards regulate the brightness, the height, and keeping the light on the subject property. And these are all um, consistent with the objective design standards that we have and performance standards in the zoning ordinance, as well as some standard conditions of approval that we apply to development projects. Uh, we have material standards to make sure materials of the fencing, overhead structures, and furniture are good quality and durable and compatible with the rest of the site. Um, signage is prohibited, um, except for a few required signs related to alcohol service um, and no trespassing signage. Um, we have some landscaping standards to make sure any proposed landscape um, is integrated well with the outdoor seating area. Um, and then... I want to talk a little bit about the parking spaces. We have some parking standards. Um, in most of the city, um, a commercial site is not required to provide parking anymore, but there are a few locations where, um, <coughs> where they are more than a half mile away from a major transit stop. And um, so parking is still required in those areas, including um, the commercial node near Seabright and Murray Street. So the proposed ordinance would allow an outdoor seating area anywhere in the city, including the Seabright-Murray area, to remove parking spaces without having to replace those parking spaces on the site. So, And there are several establishments near that intersection that have temporary patios right now that would like to convert to permanent. So this would allow them to move forward. Um, in exchange for removing those parking spaces, um, businesses would be required to provide additional bicycle parking or participate in the city's non-automobile use program, which is um, provides certain incentives for employees to use alternative transportation. Um, and then we have some parking and driveway standards that ensure that what is left of the parking lot is still functional and safe and continues to meet the um, parking and driveway design standards in the zoning ordinance. Okay, so that's that. And then I'm gonna just go through, thank you, three very small <laughs> changes that um, staff is suggesting since the draft ordinance was published with the Planning Commission packet. Um, the first one is an operation standard relating to major public special events on the premises, and we are proposing to delete this standard because major public special events, um, as they are defined in Chapter 10.64 of the Municipal Code, um, are not on private property. They are things that happen on public property, <laughs> so that does not apply in this case. Um, the second is um, with regard to overhead structures. Uh, we're proposing some very minor changes to the language that you can see here. Um, and that is just to um, clarify that the durable material standard and the standard that they need to be overhead only without any sides applies to both patio covers and roofs and not one or the other. And then finally, um, we are clarifying the language on the modified parking requirements um, to clarify that, that removing parking spaces does not require a use permit and that there's no, number of space, no limit on the number of spaces removed. And the reason why we're adding this language is that there is a part of the parking ordinance that um, requires a use permit to reduce the number of parking spaces on site, and it limits the reduction to 35% of the parking. So this would be outside of that use permit and 35% limitation requirement. So this would be, they could do the whole parking lot if they wanted to. Um, okay, and that concludes our presentation and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you for the presentation. Um, at this point, um, this is the time that commissioners can ask questions of staff. 
thanks for the report. Can you estimate the maximum size of the areas that we're talking about? Has there been a, have you done any kind of granular study of that and what the average size is? Um, there, we've done that analysis. Um, there is a variety of sizes. I would say sort of the average size is around 1,000 to 1,400 square feet. Um, there are some that are smaller than that and some that are. That's, that's average? Yeah. So I'll just ask, and maybe it's better for later, but how was the 300 square foot number arrived at? Uh, that is based on a building code requirement um, in terms of occupancy and plumbing fixture count. So this is my, this leads to my question. So maybe I can offer an amendment, or but that I can do that when we're in, when we're in discussion. So your question is answered for now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, we will open up the public hearing. Um, so at this point, uh, anybody who would like to address the commission, please, if you would, line up over here. Um, and we'll take you in order. It's helpful if you sign in. We'll spell your name right in the minutes. And, um, and then please um, let us know your thoughts, and you'll have three minutes. Go ahead. Good to go. Thank you. Um, all right, patios are important. Thank you for putting it on the list tonight. Uh, thank you for putting it first, too. Put a lot of time into this. Um, seriously, patios are important, not just for employment and community engagement, but for fiscal contribution to the city. I, I know that for a fact. I've seen it. It's not just my bar, um, but many others and many more, many more to come as well. Um, I always wanted a patio. I bought my bar six months before COVID hit, not knowing that was going to happen, but I always wanted one anyways. And when COVID did hit, I was promised by a prior city council member that there would be a clear path to permanency, an effective, easy way that was going to make sense for everyone. It hasn't happened yet, and it's, it's still not happening. Um, since joining the special subcommittee, which I've spent more and more time on, we're trying to make it work. Love, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but we're just not there. I'm, I'm very appreciative of removing the administrative use permit um, and some other little tweaks. It, it helps financially. It does, but it, it's not getting us there. It's, it's the bottom line. Um, I'm good with the operating standards. I'm fair. I'm good with the design standards. I think we all want that. I would love to make my patio more beautiful, but it's hard when I don't know how long I get to keep it, right? Um, so my suggestion is that we focus on safety and accessibility, the two most important things. We can all do that financially, fiscally, responsibly. That makes sense. Sending us into the building department and permitting, it's a killer. I'm telling you right now, with what we have right now, if we vote this forward, we're all going to lose our patios. It's just it's the bottom line. We don't want to do that. I promise you. It's going to be a fight on community and business-wise. We are going to lose patios. We have a, a city that acknowledges we have issues with permitting. We have issues with getting to code or, or meeting responsibility. We're talking about new bathrooms, possibly sprinklers. A whole can of worms once you send us to the wolves. Like, it is what's happening. I know for a fact there is there's state laws. There's I understand building codes, but I know that a city has the right and the ability to fight for their businesses. And they can write in laws that supersede state. I know this for a fact. You, I, there's attorneys that can get, to get this done. They can make exceptions. They can say, you know what? These guys have worked through COVID for three, four years. No problems. The bathrooms are, are fine. Everyone's doing well. No complaints. Let's let them have it. Let's let them keep going and generating revenue. If we lose these patios, we have to fire employees. It's a killer. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm begging you guys to, to find a way. Thank you for right your now, comments. Right now, it's not going to work. OK. It's Thank helpful. You. Thank you. OK. 
Good evening. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for sitting on this commission. Thank you. And it is helpful if you let us know your name. Oh, my name is Patrice Boyle. Okay. I am the owner of La Posta Restaurant mm -hmm. at 538 Seabright Avenue. I um, established the restaurant in 2006. The building was built in 1904. Um, I second everything that Max said. I think he has followed this very closely, as have I. Having to, um, I can, I basically the choice for me is to have a 300 square foot patio down from about 1,100 or 1,200 square feet or nothing. Um, as I said, my building was built in 1904. When I remodeled it in 2006, I put in uh, new electrical, new plumbing, new grease trap, new foundation in the front, new foundation in the back, new stairs to the upstairs apartment that's not mine, and a brand new uh, trash enclosure for both my restaurant and Linda Seabreeze Cafe. They are very grateful. The reason I had to put in the trash enclosure was because I spent so much money on the handicapped bathroom. Okay? They said, oh, you've gone over a certain amount. Now you have to make more, more improvements elsewhere. So I had to do that, right? An extra large one because there were two <laughs> restaurants. I've just learned recently that now uh, trash enclosures uh, need to have uh, fire sprinklers. You know, I mean, like the, the, the number of, of traps that are set for businesses like mine that are already licensed, that are already operating, that are, I think, you know, pretty good citizens. You know, um, it's 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 not doable for us. I will tell you that I have people working in my kitchen, in my front of house, who have been there since we opened in 2006. I'm a good employer. We're a good restaurant, and we are a civically minded restaurant. We support a lot of things. But we can't, I can't spend, it's not my building, for one, okay? So I can't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to keep the, the patio that we have. It's just not a possibility at all. And I think Rebecca said uh, 300 square foot would seat about 10 people, okay? It's hardly worth it. I mean, I would have to, I would have one less server on every night and I might have one less person in the kitchen every night, okay? So we cut down to five days a week uh, in order to make life better for everybody who was there. And I don't know. I can't afford hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Madura, um, and I'm here um, as the owner of Brady's Yacht Club in Seabright. Um, I also own the jury room on uh, Ocean Street, um, and I am soon to take over uh, the rush in on uh, Ninth Street here in Santa Cruz. Um, I have been part of this process with um, everyone from the beginning, and I really appreciate the hard work. Um, there have been a lot of improvements thus far, which we are really grateful for. Um, there's overwhelming support in our community for these patios. It's nice to have people outside, um, and we want to make it work for everybody. The 300 square foot is basically two tables, as we can all kind of imagine, and it doesn't fulfill that for our city. Um, and as Max and Patrice have pointed out, um, we just simply don't have the funds to make this happen. And we, and we want to. We want to be safe. We want to have good spaces for people and for people to enjoy. Um, and I would urge tonight if we could possibly delay this vote and um, put it back to the city. I know they're, you know, We've worked on this a lot, but I think that there's still more work to be done to figure out a plan for everybody. Um, we pay our taxes, we employ people, and those things would go down if um, if we were faced with, you know, having to get an architect and looking at 
a huge amount of money and improvements, again, for buildings that aren't ours. Um, as an aside to that, um, I'm sure that you are all aware of the recent proposal um, for the clock tower development, which is where the Russian sits. So my ask that I haven't even brought up to the city is, what can I do? I mean, I wouldn't want to apply for anything for a building that's not mine that's going to get torn down. Um, I just don't really think I have a lot of options and I feel like I'm kind of in you know a limbo <laughs> with that because I the last thing I would want to do is be non-compliant with the city um, but also as a tenant I can't spend any money on something that will disappear you know likely within a matter of time I don't know if that's going to be approved but something will um, and um, yeah, we love our patios. We really have enjoyed that the city gave us a chance to make it through COVID with these patios. None of us would have survived. And we also did that with an eye towards public safety. Um, and we just want to continue this. Um, another point is that these are 21 businesses that we're talking about on this list. It's not 100. It's not, you know, it's... and. Sorry. Finish your thought. Uh, thank you. Um, our ask has been that we could just have something special for us in recognition of the fact that we did comply with the city requirements during COVID and we used this to survive during that time and we're still climbing out of that hole. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your comments. Hello, I'm Eric Dixon. I live at 403 Seabright. And um, I just wanted to kind of give my opinion and my point of view. Um, I think that painting the uh, food serving establishments and the establishments that are primarily alcohol only with the same brush is um, it's, it's, it's misguided. Um, the, the typical patronage at an alcohol only establishment is generally different than a restaurant. Also, the hours that are uh, served at alcohol primary establishments are different. Uh, there are uh, alcohol-only establishments that abut neighborhoods in Seabright, and they are quite loud. The outdoor uh, seating is open, and the, the outdoor seating abuts uh, residences. It, it's quite loud and while the owner has made a few efforts uh, if we call if i'm woke up at 12 30 at night by loud music and loud patrons out on the patio and then i have to call or text it kind of has already disrupted my my night's sleep i get up at 3 30 in the morning i work at for the city of mountain view we've had a lot of this same issue there although they do have a pedestrian only mall that is downtown, so they don't have the problem of it abutting uh, residential neighborhoods. So I would ask that consideration be given to restaurants and bars should not be painted with the same brush. It just, uh, they're not the same. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. My name is Enda Brennan. I'm a 35-year resident of the City of Santa Cruz, and I've recently completed my four-year term on the Downtown Commission. So I know what each and every one of you has done to participate in this process, and I honor your service and want to thank you for what you've done, because in many times it is a thankless job, and I want to thank you rather than be thankless. So. I want to give you a little perspective. I did work with Ms. Unit when I was on the Downtown Commission. I was on the Ad Hoc Subcommittee for Outdoor Dining for Downtown. And we went through that process and it allowed many, many restaurants to actually stay in business, which is good for the city and for everyone in it. People all of a sudden realized, wow, we can actually sit outside. We don't have to be inside. So. We came up with a plan, and the primary 
focus there, and I hope Ms. Unit will agree, was public safety because we, the parklets in downtown, were necessarily taking up parking spaces, which meant they had vehicles traveling at anywhere from 20 to 25 to 30, 35 miles an hour within feet of where the table and chairs were. That is not what we're dealing with on private property. I want to make that very clear distinction. And you see now when you go around downtown that there are very substantial barriers because they have to be to protect people from cars because they're literally six feet away from them. Very different when you're in a private context, context when you're behind a business, you're not in a thoroughfare where there is public traffic. So that's number one. I always want to get my ask out before the buzzer goes off because then I can't get the ask out. The ask is to delay. The city has already given till next May of 2025 for people to come into compliance. There's no reason why they can't extend that period even beyond that. That's 13 months from now. Delay this. Listen to Karen who said delay it. Listen to the gentleman before me who said we need to treat establishments different based on how whether or not they're a restaurant that closes for service at 9.30, it only serves beer and wine, or whether it's a hard alcohol establishment that's going to have people partying on a patio until 1.30 in the morning. That's common sense, folks. And I would urge you, this idea that, you know, you have to get a building permit, even if it's supposedly a streamlined building permit, tell that to Margin's Wine Cubby on, we're on the west side. 481 days not because of you guys, but because of the administrative bureaucracy and the fact that things get subbed out to different organizations, you know, and, and people get stymied. That business almost went bankrupt. So please, slow down. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. Uh, Jennifer Zider. Um, I live uh, on Seabright Avenue, four doors down from Brady. Um, I've owned my home for over 20 years in that area. And a couple things uh, I'd like to say tonight. Um, somebody said you need to fight for the businesses, but you also need to fight for the residents for the residents here. Um, during COVID, we were all very happy to help businesses get through the crisis and get through the pandemic, understand that. We were told that September of 2023 is when all the outdoor would end and or they would have some kind of permitting process. It has now been extended twice, I believe, now to May of 2025, okay? And we, the residents, are having to live with the consequences of this interim hodgepodge dealing with particular uh, establishments. Um, a couple different things. I've, I've communicated with, with, with you, with uh, Josephine Buchanan, as well as uh, Council Member Sonia uh, Bruner regarding this whole matter, and I've sent multiple emails. Um, a couple things on the permitting um, establishments. Sound. Inside speakers shall be set to a reduced volume to provide ambient background music. Okay. I'm four doors down from Brady. I have dozens of text messages to Karen. It's nothing personal with Karen. Saying, can you please turn down the music? They installed a boom box, electronic with a subwoofer, heavy bass, boom, boom, boom. And we hear that all night long until the bar closes. Okay. Sometimes they, they were supposed to turn it down at 10 o'clock p.m. Instead, unless I call or text, it's boom, boom, boom that I hear through my bedroom window. I have to close my windows at night because of that noise. Um, so I'd like to have you consider that. Um, the outdoor seating is supposed to be clean and attractive. Right now it's a hodgepodge and it's kind of a blight on the neighborhood. If you ever walk by Brady's, you can know what I'm talking about. Um, the other thing I think is missing from the uh, regulations that they're putting in place is this. And I sent this to Councilman Bruner in September of 2023. I want to know if the AUPs or permits for permanent extension of outdoor seating um, for bars will be permanent to the business owner or to the establishment. So if there's a change in business, I think we need to add an additional permit procedure if there is a change in business ownership. Okay. Is there a term limitation on these outdoor permits? There's nothing in the regulations, okay? Is there a renewal period for these permits? 
is there an enforcement mechanism if they violate the terms of the regulations? There's nothing in these regulations. So I ask you to please consider enforcement mechanisms. If they violate the terms, what is our remedy? As a resident, what is our remedy? Um, I'd also like to ensure that if a business is sold, 50% or greater interest, that, again, they have to reapply for the permit process. And um, I'd like to also really quickly <laughs> ensure that, that. If, if there is a um, change in business, if it changes from you know, a, a restaurant to a bar, that that is not automatically grandfathered in, that they have to go back through the permit process. Um, anyways, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other um, comments um, from the public? It'll be just once in, unless we'll respond to you. So thank you. Not now. But hang around. We may ask questions. <laughs> um, if no one else who hasn't spoken cares to, I'm going to close the public hearing, and I'm going to bring it back to the commission. Um, commissioners may have questions. Um, there were an awful lot of good points brought up, and thank you all for taking the time to come down. This is a... A, a complicated issue. Um, so, with that, first of all, would staff like to make any general um, comments in response to public comment? Otherwise, we'll dive in as a commission. But you're welcome to fill in any blanks. Um, if I could just respond to uh, Jennifer's comments, uh, asking questions um, just about clarity of the term of the permit and those pieces. Uh, so the way the ordinance is uh, drafted right now, um, these permits run with the land, so it's a by right approval. If the business is uh, an eating or drinking establishment, they're able to do this use through um, the building permit approval process. Um, so there's not currently a term limit or anything. There's not a renewal fee. Um, this is just a one-time approval um, through that building permit. Um, and then in terms of violations, uh, if a business is not following the operating standards um, or any of the conditions that uh, are placed on them, that is through our traditional code enforcement process, um, which is uh, through a complaint-based system. So a member of the community would need to file that code complaint, um, and then our code enforcement process goes from there. Can I just ask a clarification on that point? Um, so through that existing process, um, is this then revocable? Yeah, I think it'd be like any other. I mean, since it runs with the permit. land and it is becomes, you know, essentially baked in, I'm just wondering what the. With this being a ministerial process and going through a building permit, um, that building permit is not revocable. We do have the ability to pursue um, uh, various code compliance approaches to uh, gain uh, compliance. Um, there can be administrative penalties and citations and so forth for non-compliance, um, but it would not be revocable. It would just be the monetary penalties, which can escalate um, and um, be quite encouraging in terms of their, um, uh, their monetary implications. Mm -hmm. um, but as proposed, um, uh, with this being a, a building permit process, it is not a revocable um, permit, as is the case if it were a use permit, for example. Okay. And it is a tricky issue because um, business owners are investing significant amounts of money, and um, they really need certainty in order to be able to do that. So. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of issues to balance here, um, Commissioner Thompson. I think uh, that was actually one of the notes that I made to myself here while hearing the the public that um, there is a d distinction between a building permit and a use permit, and it does seem um, that if folks are investing in making improvements um, in the public way as part of their operation, that the building par permit portion of it certainly. Um, and needs to have standing over time. Um, but there's a use permit aspect to um, alcohol service in general, always. Um, and so it does seem to me that um, uh, it doesn't need to be kind of either just one or the other. Um, it does seem to me that the 
the kinds of um, hours of operation and noise level and these kinds of things that are routinely handled at a use permit level should be something that we can devise our, our, our rules to um, uh, allow those things to be uncoupled. That's a great point that you know, there, there is a distinction between the alcohol service part. Um, most businesses do have that use permit. Um, I uh, suspect that some of the businesses represented here this evening are legal nonconforming. They predate the requirements for a use permit and have been in continuous operation. I, I haven't done that research, but I, I would also just note that you're, you're correct. In most instances, and for all new businesses, there is that alcohol sales component um, uh, that um, there could be a revocation. I, I think I would um, look to Clara not having looked at that um, specific issue, but um, are we requiring uh, use permits for um, alcohol sales associated with restaurants? Do you know that off the top of your head? I'd have to look in the code. Yes. Um, well, generally speaking, we require use permits for alcohol service in a restaurant or any kind of alcohol sale. Mm -hmm. So, so just to so clarify, that then that that's running with um, the restaurant, um, but it um, this is treated. What we're talking about is treated as a building permit. Um, so that is that's correct. Well, so can I, so yeah, a, a use permit does run with, with the, the land. land. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, so if the use ceases and a new restaurant comes in and takes up that use, then they inherit the alcohol use permit. Mm -hmm. um, but if that use goes away for like at least six months, okay, then then they have to start over. They have to start over. Yeah, that's and correct. and you can see how that's important also to the value of the business. Um, we're sort of getting back to um, balancing. Right, as Commissioner Thompson was saying, the, there's that separation. the The patio, the outdoor patio, would just be a uh, building permit, and so. Um, the operations of that, if it were being too noisy, um, uh, that could have implications for their alcohol sales. If they have a use permit, that use permit could be modified or revoked. Um, but if it were um, not associated with the alcohol sales, you know, a restaurant may not even sell alcohol. So they, they may not have a use permit um, associated with that. The patio itself wouldn't be revoked yeah, with with the building permit having been issued, it, but but there still could be those administrative remedies, the, the citations for say nuisance activity or um, noncompliance with the hours of operation or uh, music that's playing too loud, even if there is an alcohol sale. If there is not alcohol sales, okay, great. The notion that use permits usually have uh, limits for proper operations that aren't detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare. And one would hope that the, the, the city could use those tools to make sure that um, whether it was grandfathered in as an alcohol use, that it wasn't necessarily grandfathered in to be disruptive or uh, detrimental to public health, safety, and welfare. And so it just seems as if that's, um, uh, that's an important part of this that should be separated from the notion of whether or not it's a good idea to have these outdoor um, uh, dining areas. Um, and I, I would hate to see them just treated as just one thing. They're really two separate things. Um, uh, because uses we do regulate, uh, even when they're grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? I'll just go back to the question about the area. I take very seriously the comments of, that we've heard about um, having spaces that are so limited in size, being able to avoid the building permit process. I think that you have to uh, apply, you have to, and here's the person that can answer the question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think you have to treat overhead structures, things that are physical improvements, that have access, you know, uh, control issues, accessibility concerns. You have to deal with those. Um, but I would love to see if there's a way that we could avoid triggering, remodeling the entire building uh, 
in the event that someone wants to go over, wants to do 325 square feet. I think, uh, I think that it would be very desirable to try to avoid that trigger. Thanks for that comment, Commissioner McKelvey. And, um, you know, we, we certainly agree with that. You know, we want to have, um, we want to be able to facilitate this as well. I think, you know, most people enjoy outdoor seating at restaurants and drinking establishments, and um, it has been um, successful, particularly um, uh, coming out of the pandemic. We've recognized that um, that we can provide more of those and um, provide a, a great entertainment uh, option for our community. Um, we do have challenges with the, the building code um, and um, how the building code applies. That's something that you know comes to us from the state. And I would like to let you know that our building official, uh, John Gervasoni, is in the audience and um, is, is happy to um, answer questions. He is uh, you know, our technical expert on, on the building code. And so um, if you have any specific questions regarding that, um, I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, talk through those with you. Hi, Mr. Gervasoni, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thanks for joining us. Um, you may have heard my question. I'm wondering if there are ways that we can uh, not extend uh, recalculation of the fixture requirements, the bathroom uh, requirements for uh, just these, these uses that, that are being proposed. It, it seems like a a 300 square foot trigger is going to be a huge unit cost increase that would likely kill a lot of proposals for um, making improvements like this. Um, is there a way that um, it could be treated as some sort of accessory use? I mean, the, orig the origination of this, as was stated by the by staff, uh, was in order to create more space between people uh, in the emergency context of COVID. Um, but is there is there are there any tools that we have in the in the code that would allow us to avoid those triggers for revisiting fixture uh, increases and things like that? That was exactly the tool I used. So you're you're as code savvy as me. Um, going into the California Plumbing Code, there is a required plumbing fixture calculation. Uh, the last two code cycles that says you need to use the same table as you use for exiting out of the building code to calculate occupant loads which determine how many plumbing fixtures you need. So when the question was posed to me by Mr. Unit, he said, well, what would be the maximum that we could use? <clears throat> and I said, well, we've, we've already given, so for exiting, it's a 15 square foot per person occupant load. I looked at that at several different restaurants and I thought that's really unfair because there is no way you're going to have 100% of those people needing to use the restroom at the same time. Years ago, you remember there was a table A and it gave you twice the square footage per person, thereby cutting the occupant load in half, which is what I've proposed in this situation. I've said, well, we're not going to use the building code. We're going to use table 4-1, which gives you 30 square feet per person in a restaurant, bar, drinking, dining establishment, thereby cutting it down. You also go to the exceptions for the plumbing fixture counts, and it says if you have an occupant load of 10 or less, you only need one restroom. Um, B and M occupancy. So most small restaurants are not an A2. They don't fall into that fixture count. They're, they're under the Bs, um, although you do have to still count a B the same, I mean, it's it's the use, right? It's the restaurant, it's the bar. It's not a B business office use where you do have very low occupant loads, you know, unless you're like a call center or something like that, which they start compounding it. So um, maybe bring this thing back. Um, so by giving them a larger occupant load factor, cutting the occupant load in half, we thought that that was very fair. So 300 square foot divided by 30, 10 people. Um, if, if you go back to the COVID situation, they were moving their dining outdoors. They weren't allowed to dine indoors. Now we're trying to combine both. Well, you're doubling your occupant load in some cases. So the point that I made was 
if you stick to this 300 square foot for a little bit of an outdoor dining area, you wouldn't be increasing the occupant load by more than 10, thereby we wouldn't be enforcing more plumbing fixtures, which gets very cost, you know. If you're talking twelve, fifteen thousand dollars for a bathroom now, you, you know the cost. So that's my point. Just the the unit cost is so astronomical exactly. that it will pretty much yeah. it, it becomes so kind where, of meaningless. So if it's not three hundred, where do we put that mark? And and how do I justify it? Because I do have to enforce all the codes, you know, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, building, the the whole nine yards. So. I, I thought it was a fair mark. Um, a typical outdoor dining area with 42 inch high, you know, perimeter um, fencing, if you want to call it, a, a guard, whatever, to try and, you know, mark the area <laughs> off, keeping it at 300 square foot, no problem. It's an easy, simple deal for building. Um, you know, keep um, market umbrellas, portable furniture, mm -hmm. you know. Until we start getting into making permanent fixtures, overhead structures, making them larger, which now we're really increasing the occupant load, mm -hmm. that's where the real building permit comes in. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know if that really answers your no, question. No, it does. It does. I'm, I'm partially trying to get these issues out so that people know what's being considered because okay. there's a lot to it. Um, the, as I said before, you can't avoid review of you know, overhead structures, things that are going to be permanent improvements, mm -hmm. obviously, foundations if, if they're required. But um, I would just like to explore every avenue of making these uses seen as accessory to the I'm, primary I'm use, open to any ideas that someone else has. Um, but, I, but I thought that was a fair assessment. I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Th thank you. And I'm sorry the public hearing has been closed. I'm sorry. But commissioners can ask questions, but... Um, uh, so um, I will take that question. I think we just got that. How much does the bathroom cost to install? Fifty. It was an estimate. Yeah. So. Anyway, Twelve thousand. It, it could be more. It's a whole bunch you of know, money, it's, and it's, I think we all it's know It's like that. Are you building one out on the end of West Cliff, or are you right. building one out, you know, somewhere right. else. So yeah. We uh, we understand that it is okay. it is very. It's expensive. expensive. It's yes. very expensive. I, I yeah. <clears throat> And I do sympathize with that. No, and, really I, and I also appreciate that, that we are balancing a lot of issues here. And I guess one of my questions is that um, the city, in fact, cannot overrule the California Building Code. Um, however, what I, what I think I'm hearing is um, looking for a way to apply the CBC um, in, a, in, a, in a way that meets our local, um, you know, to the extent that we have... Right. Um, any kind of flexibility, and um, I'm sure you've been looking at that, and that's why you came up with the 300 square feet in the first place. So, okay, more questions. Um, I would. I'm curious in this process what other communities that we referenced um, that are doing this successfully and perhaps differently. Um, yeah. So Surprisingly, not a lot of communities are actually doing this. Um, a lot that we've surveyed decided to do away with their private property programs and stick with the current codes and ordinances that they had on the books. Um, yeah, we talked to a lot of other jurisdictions, and they just said it was too challenging with the building code com you know, pieces and all of those uh, different components that we've evaluated. So uh, all that to be said, we did look at San Diego and um, City of Fremont, have taken some approaches that we've been able to review. Uh, City of Los Angeles um, has, you know, it's much bigger <laughs> jurisdiction, but you know they've been really studying this and they're rolling out a program. Um, so San Diego um, is taking a similar approach in that it's a building permit requirement. It's allowed by right. They have certain parameters. Ours very similarly aligns with that. Um, they don't have a different process in terms of square footage size. It's just you go through that building permit process, um, their standard review process. Uh, Fremont, they do have some requirements that if you have a use permit of some sort of discretionary permit, you have to amend that use permit to be able to go forward, um, and then it would be the typical building permit process. So um, I, I feel that our regulations we brought forward are pretty progressive in terms of what other jurisdictions are doing, being able to transition it to this by right approval 
um, and just having those guidelines baked into the ordinance um, and, and really using that building permit to move it forward, right? I think none of us take issue with any of that. I think there was effort. I think, as John has said, um, Commissioner McKelvey, sorry, um, the big issue is this because it's prohibitive. And so I've got a couple more questions, which is, was there an analyzation done uh, on the 21 businesses that are looking to do this and a cost evaluation or a, an impact evaluation on, on the a possibility that this is even a viable solution? Or, yeah, so I'd like to hear a little bit about like, what the city did in terms of that investigation. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, as Commissioner McKelvey asked previously, you know, we did look at sort of what is the average size of these spaces, recognizing that that 300 threshold is low, and a lot of these businesses have those larger spaces. Um, so we've done that analysis. Um, we have also looked through our public records, see what building permit, building plan uh, records we have on file so we can sort of look at these businesses, see what their current occupancy loads are. We've just gone through the step currently of pulling those plans and seeing what we have on file. Um, we haven't done analysis in terms of you know what in each individual business is, um, experiences. But um, to be able to do that, we have also discussed internally being able to have preliminary evaluation meetings available to businesses to meet at the building counter, or set up a specific meeting to review if we have plans on file or if, they, if the businesses can present you know, a rough sketch that has those dimensions and do that initial evaluation before they take the plunge to hire an architect or go through this to do more of that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think with the private property spaces, everything is, everyone is so unique based on their site constraints based on their building, how many restaurant, you know, how many restrooms they have, how large their space is. So it's hard to do a, you know, a one easy evaluation. You absolutely know that. Um, but that's those are the steps that we've taken to try to um, help assist with that initial evaluation for the businesses and um, and see what their path would be through this. So I think what I'm gathering from that is that we don't actually know what the fiscal implications would be to the individual or to the city if we move forward with this? Yeah, we do not know the cost to make these permanent approvals. Um, I think we can all agree. I know we all agree that outdoor seating is huge. Santa Cruz has had very little compared to other cities that enjoy the weather that we have, and so we're very fortunate to have that, and so I'm pretty focused on making sure that whatever we do is going to support that. And so I'm, um, I'm kind of curious because it sounds like we had um, some of that internal evaluation on, on how we set that 300 square foot, and it makes perfect sense. I'm just wondering if we have really exhausted all of the possibilities to avoid this because everything else is fine except for except for the bathroom fixture and potentially you know if with the overhead structures and sprinkling or I mean there's there's a host of those things that are going to make this completely cost prohibitive um, for probably the majority of people so I just would like to know if there's any other way just reading that Governor Newsom extended this through 2000, the, the, what do they call it? It's a, an act to amend uh, health and safety code relating to business pandemic relief, and it's extended through 2026. Yeah. So is there, is that uh, anything that we can at least temporarily utilize? Which specific? It's a health and safety code you were referring 1217. to. Um, I would have to research that. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is one of my questions or thoughts. Like, and I understand there's neighbors who are speaking of the impact, so that's the reason to do something. Mm -hmm. But putting that aside just for a second, very carefully, technically, can we just extend it indefinitely if we want to, or another year, or, you know, just put off the decision? I, I would defer to our building official. You know, I think that there are certainly public safety measures that, you know, have 
been reduced during this temporary. We've allowed businesses to really, you know, expand with their size without doing that review. Um, so I think that, you know, we are really trying to move forward towards mm -hmm. these permanent options. We've been able to do that for the parklets and really trying to come to a resolution on that. Um, but yeah, we can certainly research that health and safety policy. And, and I think as Rebecca said, they're, they're very unique in right. every situation. You have to look at each one individually. Right. So that's another thought I had, having sat up here for Oh, so many years of ADU revisions and then the state changing law and then coming back. I think it was, I could say it was a pretty good success like grandfathering in ADUs. So are there potential for grandfathering in the, it's not that long of a list of people who have them now at their current size, you know, and then applying the new standard fairly to all new applications? I don't believe that we could grandfather in the building permit part of it. So yeah. what we've built out in this is creating they have that their permit now. Right. We've so created they have to start something. Yep. We've created the by right approval so that they don't have to go through that use permit process, which is really, you know, grandfathering mm -hmm. and reuse. But the building approval that reviews accessibility, um, fire safety. Yeah, like who's to even those. say what size it is now, yeah. right? It's all just kind of a temporary yeah. parking lot deal. Um yeah. I would also add that uh, this, you know, cap that we're speaking about is also sort of a policy discussion internally of how we're processing these and trying to create that more streamlined approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, regardless of the size, a business does need to obtain, you know, this building review and approval. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to put forward in an additional streamlining manner. Um, so it's something we can continue to look at. It's not set in stone by the ordinance. Yeah. It's really that internal, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Clara, but I believe that's more of our, in, you know, city staff led proposal. Um, from a policy direction of trying to just create an, another layer of streamlining. Um. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would go ahead. I appreciate that. I would say still move forward with that despite <laughs> what we decide here. Yeah. Um, but I really, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm feeling like we need more information. Um, there's just a lot to play here, and I just, yeah, yeah, so. Um, some of, um, I can appreciate that, and I also appreciate, first of all, thank you for everyone who worked on the committee and everyone who's trying to work through this. We really clearly are benefiting from, um, you know, these spaces. I hear the bumps. Um, uh, but also balancing out the, you know, what, you know, public safety matters and applying the building code even when it doesn't make sense. Um, I do wonder, um, I'd be interested in more analysis about these 21 businesses. Um, be, I know that they're gonna be all over the place and um, I appreciated the standards and the design standards that you're trying to make them, you know, permanent outdoor spaces that are safe, that are attractive, that are not a nuisance, um, that don't break the bank. Um, you know, all of, all of those pieces um, it, but I wonder, um, 300 square feet, you know, is pretty small. Um, and I, I wonder, um, I guess I'm not exactly sure how many of these 21 businesses um, could viably meet the standard um, that we're de des describing here and continue to have, um, you know, viable outdoor space. Um, uh, you know, I don't think 300 square feet is, um, I, I agree with the points made, not that many are gonna be able to go for that, although I did think it was a great idea. Maybe we could just say 300 square feet and then we start to count. I, I mean, <laughs> I know it doesn't work that way. Um, but it, I, I would be interested in knowing that. If someone had actually posed that to me at one time, can we get credit on the first Yeah, could we say 300 square feet and then start to count? It's the actual square footage. I know. Nice try, though. Uh. <laughs> so if you keep that 300 square foot empty, yeah, I won't count it. <laughs> but, but I mean, to pull back, we're allowing an mm. avenue for something to happen that can't now, so that's good. That so everybody I, What wants. do you think, staff? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's worth further study of kind of that level of detail? I'm interested in it, but I'm also feeling like, you know, um, we don't want to just delay this if it's going to be a fruitless exercise. 
I would say that I am happy to continue to advocate looking at ways to increase that number. I, you know, John has done a great job working with us on doing that analysis. You know, I, if there are other ways that people are looking at the code that we can review, I mean, I think that we're always interested in that. I, um, like I said, this is sort of that internal policy process. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily impact the or, you know the ordinance changes mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. forward because mm -hmm. um, there is just still always going to be that requirement. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm the economic development manager. My goal is to support and advocate for businesses and be able to create the most you know, streamlined and cost-effective path for them. Um, so that's something that I'm happy to continue to explore you know, and reach out to other cities, see if there's still more that we could do. Yeah, Commissioner Dan. Oh. Go ahead. No, finish what your, your train. I'm gonna go in a different direction. Um, I think, you know, there, Everybody has done and exhausted a lot. And and I feel like there's a couple of things. One is, is I don't think we're the only, I know we're not the only city because we're dealing with something like this in Palo Alto right now. And so there's a lot of jurisdictions that are going through this very same conversation. And our my experience, you know, is that things, because of that, things will change. And it's it's beyond our city. It's it's happening in larger governments, and so because there's this ability to postpone, it's not that necessarily. I think we haven't done our job. It's that there may be other avenues that are in process right now that could help this situation. And so, if there's a mechanism where we can delay this to to see what else is happening out there on a larger governmental platform that will help and resolve this, that we should think about exercising that delay just for that reason alone. So that's. Did you have a comment, Commissioner Dan? Yeah, I do, and a couple questions. Um, so thank you for the staff work on this. And I also think that it seems like a good idea to continue to study whether or not we could increase the Square footage over 300 square feet, I, I think that's a fine idea. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the difference uh, between alcohol-only establishments and restaurants and how that's going to work functionally um, as the way it's laid out um, in the ordinance. Because I do, and I also want to recognize the neighbors um, and their... And what they said, I was on the County Planning Commission for 16 years when we went through the vacation rental ordinance, so I'm very much aware of when a new use goes into uh, your neighborhood, how impactful that can be. Yeah. Um, so I do think we should address some of those issues. We should have recourse for um, establishments that are not following um, the rules. Um, and so my a specific question is, um, the hours of operation are the same for restaurants and bars. Bars don't close at 10 o'clock. Do all the patrons then go inside? Is that what happens now? Yeah, well, the outdoor seating area should yes. be closed at 10 p.m., and those patrons would need to go inside or okay. leave the premises. Yeah. But it sure sounds like, and just from what I hear anecdotally, that's not what happens. So then what, what's the recourse? What, hap what's, what do those neighbors have to do? Uh, they would need to file a code complaint to be able to have their system off. The and then what happens? The immediate issue is uh, to call the police. The code compliance is not on duty after 10 p.m. And so if there is an issue, um, then it, uh, the non-emergency line, um, you know, clearly if there's an emergency, dial 911. Okay. You know, um, but if it's a noise complaint, for example, it would be the non-emergency line for police. And then they then coordinate with our uh, code enforcement team. And our code enforcement team can um, uh, then take the appropriate steps to gain compliance. We're always looking to, to gain compliance is our goal. Um, and if someone did call code enforcement, you know, we would refer that to the police um, so that they could do those evening inspections. But, um, you know, they're not going to get it on the same night, right, right. If, you, if you file a code compliance complaint. So I just wanted to sure. put that out there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so 
I guess to me it doesn't make sense that we would have hours outside at a bar that's 10, 10 p.m. I just think reasonably that's just not going to happen. People aren't going to like at 10 o'clock at night when you're having a good time get up and go inside. So I do think more work needs to be done on that end of it too. So I, I would be in favor of delaying it just to do a little bit more work to take a more realistic approach to those types of differences so that, you know, the neighbors can um, have both a good night's sleep and then also have some recourse um, if, if there's an establishment that's not complying with the, with the rules. So for instance, I think, you know, if there is X number of uh, bona fide complaints, there should be a, some sort of recourse there so that they just can't pile up. And I think that most, most businesses are fine with that because most businesses want to be compliant and be good neighbors. And um, so I, I'd like to see something like that. So, so we can, you know, have this excellent, wonderful use that we all love and benefit from, but that so it doesn't um, unduly impact the neighborhood. Commissioner Kennedy. So in my many years up here, we, I've had, I can think of three where we like pulled administrative use permits. So I, I think maybe more education for us on how that works. They're all downtown. One was a liquor store just egregiously selling booze to kids with no IDs. I won't name any names, but we all know what I'm right. talking about. There was a bar, too, that had a whole series of complaints. And yeah, PD started with neighbor complaints and took just a went long time. up the chain. It took a long time, but eventually we yanked their permit. You know, it was not an easy meeting, but uh, those recourses are there. And again, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but. But I um, guess it'd be mm -hmm. great to put, the, you know, things yeah, in place to avoid number. that, too, yep. and so we don't have to get. Oh, I'm, I'm not process. saying I'm saying I also think that it would probably be reasonable to do an investigation, given that at least the business that have been mentioned now have been in practice for several years now, that there's a evaluation on actual police calls and activity so that that can be fairly analyzed and then determined whether or not it's reasonable to issue that. So, um, because there there has to be history of that. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. And um, I I have to wonder, um, and uh, as a person who's generally in favor of regulation, especially when it's for public safety, um, but I always want to wonder, you know, why, you know, and like. Why do we want enough bathrooms? Okay, um, that you know, does it make sense that we are counting this outdoor space that we all want as the same as it is indoor space? Well, it kind of does. Um, I, but um, I mean, certainly the CBC is going to apply. I've I've watched and been tangentially involved with trying to make changes to the CBC, and you want to talk about glacial speed, um, but you know, but is 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 there a compelling reason in the interest of public safety? Um, and there should be. I mean, for for each of the applications, we may not be able to look past it, but if we think something, you know, applying the CBC doesn't make sense in applying it to outdoor space, let's at least look at it. Um, we may not have the ability or we leave ourselves vulnerable if we say that we're, we're not going to apply it. I don't think that's probably a good idea. But understanding um, what it is, especially when um, we're talking about space that, you know, I'll broadly say most of the community wants um, this outdoor space used this way. It's a, just a lot more fun to go out for dinner when you can sit outside. It's just more comfortable. Um, and. I don't think a lot of people appreciate the tremendous cost. Um, and sometimes the application of the code um, ends up not making sense um, in the long run. I'm very sympathetic to that argument. As a person who had to, in fact, improve the alley behind my ADU, but none of my neighbors did. <laughs> and uh, I think we all wish it was approved, but you know, rules change. And um, you know, we always hope that they, um, are fair when they change and they apply and knowing more about that I think would be helpful um, and I, I thought we I thought it was a pretty good breakdown of um, 
what are the public safety issues and how does the CBC apply. Um, but I think understanding the actual impact on the real businesses that we want to preserve and support. I mean, my first thought was, couldn't economic development just go get a whole bunch of money and just help, you know, set up a program? But I, I know how money flows also. Um, uh, so anyway, I guess I'm, I'm saying I'm in favor of a little more discussion and study. Um, although I think that this committee has done a terrific job. Um, and, but we're just, I just don't think we're all the way there. I was thinking that too, by the end of this analysis, you'll pretty much have the design for the 12 businesses that want it, you know. Right. Well, 21, I think, isn't yeah, it? Well, yeah. Yeah. That's, a, I mean, that, it, that, it's, it's not a small piece of work. Um, you know, to, to, I mean, if it was 12, and you said, well, let's, it's a little easier to look at 12, 21 is, and they're, I'm assuming they're all different. It's probably no two alike. Uh, in, in terms of the, you know, what the cost is and how successful even they are and because the business is very also, so. Uh, All right, so what are people thinking? Do we do a time certain or? I'm trying to think if we've continued one recently. Uh, give it 60 days or? I don't know, 2026? 20, 36, <laughs> so. Well, we, um, it, sound, it sounds like we are generally interested in some more deliberation, not for the sake of deliberation, um, because not because we're going to exactly wait for the law to change, but I think your point of this, we are not the only community. Um, figuring out a way through this is, um, you know, and that, the other thing is, if we set a rule, it isn't set in stone. We are looking for a way to make it work. And sometimes when we're doing something new, we set it up knowing that we're going to be re revisiting it. And, um, you know, I think there's, yeah, go ahead. Could I just make a motion that we continue this for a minimum of 60 days? And during that time, we investigate whether AB 1217 applies, which extends the, you know, basically emergency the emergency rate. regulations mm -hmm. through 2026 and whether it applies to this uh, deliberation. Um, in my review of it um, during the course of this, um, I, I don't see that it applies to the bathroom issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I do see that it applies to several other issues, um, parking and service of food um, when there may not be licensed, you know, service of food and storage of food outside and things of like okay. that nature. I didn't see anything specific to this. It, it I, I will say it was a cursory review um, during this, so. It was fast, but yeah, happy to it's take a, a deeper dive into that. Very broad language, but I think it would be great to get a legal determination about whether or not it covers it or not, because that's essentially what the current program has been established under, the the, the emergency uh, COVID response. Yeah, yeah, we're happy to take a look at that along with these other issues. I mean, we're, we want to look at whatever options are out there and, and available. So I'll second that motion and just add that, like, it's not, I don't think it's been a motion yet. Didn't you make a motion? Yeah. Oh, did you, mm -hmm. is there, I'm sorry, would you? I was just making a motion to extend it for a minimum of 60 days, during which time analysis will be done on whether it legally fits into the definition okay. for emergency COVID response. Uh, okay, and we have a second to that motion? Mm-hmm. Um, and um, do we want to specify any other investigation and exploration as part of this? We may look for, thank you for, for putting a motion on the floor. We might have some other issues to explore. I, I have uh, just uh, one thought um, because uh, a lot of this has been as assuming that the restaurants already have the maximum capacity for the restrooms that they have, which I suspect is not the case. Um, so it would be interesting to know out of the 21 that are on the table, uh, how many of them could have uh, substantially more outdoor seating area without any new restrooms? Um, and, That's a good uh, point. <laughs> and then um, uh, I think coupled with that is um, the notion that the city might have an interest in helping uh, financially mm -hmm. with the provision of restrooms is not crazy at all. Um, if they have the money, it's not crazy. Well, um, the uh, city spends money on all kinds of things. Mm 
Um, and uh, especially if this only affects um, a few businesses, mm -hmm. it makes all the more sense to just inquire mm -hmm. about the reasonableness of using some redevelopment money uh, for something that has, I think, a, a broad public benefit. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, I, I, I'm supporting the motion because I think that's the kind of stuff we can figure I, out. I would accept that as a friendly amendment or yeah. however you want, you want to phrase it. Yeah, and I, I uh, um, so to clarify, I think it is a good point also. The friendly amendment would be to um, also take a look at what the real impact is of these rules on the actual 21 businesses so we, so we know who's actually affected by it and to what extent. Is that, you got that, Tess? Yep. Okay. And um, this isn't in the first, motion, but I... Let me make sure that okay. we have the, um, the maker yep. of the motion accepted. That sounds good to me. Okay. And I mean, I also would personally think it makes a lot of sense to look at uh, some different sets of rules for bars and restaurants, bars that stay open till 2 a.m. I mean, if you're a bar and you close at 10, that's fine. Right. Um, but if you stay open later, um, I'd like to see some thought put into how that functionally works if the outdoor area is technically supposed to be closed at 10, but your establishment stays open much later. And uh, do we have the maker of the motion accepted? I, I totally, I think that's perfectly appropriate. So fine okay. to me as well. Okay. Uh, the last comment I'd just add on in the second or the motion is mm -hmm. like the, the restaurants that got us through COVID are truly heroes. So any oh, sort yeah. of like let's grandfather in those folks only argument, for me that works. Cause boy did I love to get a takeout food with a newborn. Boy, COVID, I, so yeah, no kidding. I do think state law is state law, but... Um, I, but, you know, you make exceptions. So, um, I think, are you proposing that we also ask staff to look into whether there's yeah, any way well, to grandfather or the... Or um, grandfather. Um, our uh, community COVID heroes? <laughs> we did this for ADUs because folks were providing housing, even yeah. though their AD might not be, like, the nicest one in town, you know? So, that's what um, I'm thinking. Okay, and uh, you're all right with that, Commissioner McKelvey? Absolutely. And you got that, Tess? <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question about sure. the, a minimum of 60 days? Does that, does that mean that, this, that the city is setting what that term is? or how Should we that? say 60 days? Well, I, I mean, my first comment was going to be if Maybe we should ask staff 60 days, days is not of, enough to yeah. do what we're asking. Is that the right number? So. I like the minimum if it takes a Okay. Great. I just was curious then if we say minimum, what does that mean? They Then they get to set the schedule of when they think it's reasonable? Is that how that works? That's how I understood it. Okay. Could we say that? We'll, mm. Sorry. But could we say that we'll come back with an informational item? We can certainly come back with that in 60 days. Um, I mean, we can absolutely come back and update on where right. we're at. With I think that would suit the purpose. So, I, Lee, does I, that work for you, like, workflow-wise and everything with staff? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Commissioner Polhemus. Well, I was just going to say, if they come back with an informational item and, you know, we get some bites from the commission, then we can agendize it and just move forward from there. So maybe just some... Mm -hmm. Updates maybe every other month. Okay, any other discussion on the motion with its amendments? Um, with that, we'll call for a roll call vote. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. McKelvey? Yes. Paul Hamus? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Chair Conway? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your participation, and thank you for your hard work um, figuring this out. All right, and we, we are going to have a, our meeting will continue, so you're welcome to continue the discussion, but we'd appreciate it if you did it outside the doors. And again, thanks so much for coming. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can you guys take your conversation outside? We're still having a meeting. Thank you so much. 
And thank you, staff. Nice work. Okay, we'll give it just another. Uh, Okay. All right. Again, thank you very much. And uh, we're moving on with the agenda, do we have informational items? We do have a few quick informational items for you. Um, at the council's upcoming meeting on April 30th, um, note that is off off schedule um, per typical uh, council require council meeting date. So this will be Tuesday, the 30th of April, instead of the 23rd. Um, we have the appeal for the food bin that this commission heard um, back in uh, January. Um, we also have um, some a, a determination of consistency for the annual report for the Delaware Edition project. Um, they are proposing to um, have a uh, some amendments to the. Um, CCNRs, oh. and um, uh, the project that they have is uh, a 161 unit residential development oh, wow. on the north end adjacent to the tracks. Um, and um, council will be considering the um, consistency of that proposal, which includes a lease to UCSC for um, uh, 99 units to. Um, to student housing and uh, 62 units to um, staff and faculty housing. Wow. And it's adjacent to the future natural bridges station, that one. <laughs> Just FYI. Right. Um, and then um, moving on to the um, planning commission. Oh, I should, I should note um, we are anticipating the appeal of the um, cannabis. Uh, establishment at the um, May the 14th council so uh, you heard that last month or so um, that's in the former Emily's Emily's bakery at um, uh, Mission and Laurel streets okay yeah, I heard um, the school didn't appeal but the neighbors did is that accurate you know? there it, the the appeal was received from a neighbor um, I believe they indicated they were representing a group, and I can't remember okay. if it was a group of neighbors. But it, know, wasn't but the it, school it board. was not the school board themselves or the school themselves. That, Small progress. Yeah, it does. Um, and then um, for the plan, so that's the council um, updates on upcoming items. Um, for the planning commission, we um, do not anticipate having a May 2nd hearing. Um, but we are planning to reconvene on May 16th. We have um, our annual um, CIP, um, General Plan Consistency. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we will also be providing the uh, annual progress report um, that we submit to mm -hmm. state HCD. Um, again, I think we, we mentioned this to you the last time we met, uh, you know, we officially notified the state that we met our arena targets in every income category. Um, and so you can, you can view that material now, if you'd like, it's on the second meeting in, uh, March for the council. We're just putting it on the commission's agenda in case you have any questions or comments or thoughts for, um, uh, how we can, um, consider uh, our progress in the future. Um, and finally, on 516, um, we are anticipating having a, um, a gym at 716 Ocean Street that um, requires a use permit. Another gym? Another gym. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, All that outside drinking, you know, we need more gyms. <laughs> Yeah. Run, run by the um, is there anticipated to be a meeting on the 6th of June? Give me a moment and I can tell you. I will say with the 6th of June, it's um, a little ways out. Things can pop on to uh, our radar. You know, somebody resubmits and they're ready to go. Um, as of right now, I am not anticipating anything for the 6th of June. 
Um, I will say that we are um, tentatively considering a um, planning commission and council joint study session on the downtown plan sometime later in June. Um, that's to be determined in terms of the date and um, you know, whether that's a joint session or a separate planning commission versus council, still TBD. But um, that's the only thing that I have um, anticipated for June at this point. Okay. Other, thing, other things may come up, though. <laughs> I, I won't hold you to that. Yeah. Um, does this commission meet in July? Yes. It does, mm -hmm. yes. When um, there's items. Yeah, when, there, when there's items. It, and I don't have anything on the list for July right now, but again, you know, especially with that far out, you know, yeah. a resubmittal or even a, a new project that's in really good shape. Is it could helpful feasibly. to you to know commissioners' um, travel schedules for the summer at this point in time? Absolutely. If if you would want to, uh, if you have travel yeah. schedules, well, please we won't email. be meeting on July fourth because it's a Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. I'll be out of time. <laughs> we will not be meeting on July fourth, and um, I think that's a great idea, Chair Conroy. If you have. Um, uh, plans so that you know you're not going to be available certain times during the summer if you could email tests and that way we can plan ahead as well you know if it turns out everyone's gone the the first you know Thursday in August for example you know we might be able to have a meeting first or second Thursday in August when that's off cycle and not really delay a project um, so other than just a week so um, we'll certainly look at that, and yes, please um, keep us posted. We'll all let Tess know what's going on. Yes. Boy, is everyone asking me about the clock tower project? Is that is like in the last two weeks? I guess it was a newspaper article. About? You know, that's uh, the one that I heard about. Uh, what's the status on that? I looked at the project page. It's like application submitted, or that's the status. Yeah. That's yeah. As far as we're that going. is an SB three thirty application. We do not review that application. Right. All that does is it you know, we we determine whether it's complete under the state statute. And if it's complete, then it locks it into the, um, uh, the rules and regulations that are in place at the time. And so, um, you know, we've had a lot of questions. How does it comply with this or that? And we haven't reviewed it. And, you know, we will review a formal application that's submitted or we have a, a pre-application process that um, is an additional cost that, we um, then use that, those funds to, to review both in planning or um, there's an additional uh, cost if you want it reviewed by public works, fire, uh, police, uh, water, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, and that hasn't been paid for at this point, so it's really just a, was it complete Burger. and is it locked in? Okay, that's helpful. Okay. I should put in a plug for, you know, going on a ride along with the PD. I don't know if you all have done this. You should. Any, any citizen can do it. But you will understand the ins and outs of alcohol permits. Like, yeah. <laughs> like you wouldn't believe by rolling around with one of our dads. Seriously. I'll, I'll second it's really interesting. Commissioner Kennedy's experience. It's, uh, it's an eye-opener. Really yeah. I'll just note. I um, asked to do it uh, one time, but they wouldn't let me drive. So. <laughs> Uh, I'll note, uh, related to that and actually related to a number of the discussions that um, you had today and particularly related to um, Commissioner Thompson's comments um, and others about that, that separation between alcohol uses, um, following our um, outdoor dining um, work, uh, the same team members here in economic development and planning are anticipating um, looking at the alcohol sales and entertainment um, regulations that we have. Um, there were some very significant updates that occurred uh, probably 15 years ago at this point. Um, and, um, you know, it's, I think it's time for a fresh look at those. Um, TBD, what, what um, changes are made, um, because this team is really focused on the outdoor dining at this point. But that, that next step will be, um, you know, learning from the same things that we've heard here, including, you know, that, that separation component. And, and while they're separate, you know, they're also connected in, in some respects. And so um, we uh, plan on taking a fresh look at that and seeing um, what rules. And there's certainly some that we've identified that we're saying, you know, that could stand to be updated. And those, is, those have triggered the, the desire mm -hmm. to take a fresh look at the whole process. 
So that's another thing for you to look forward to. It'll probably be sometime, you know, agenda. late this year, right? <laughs> By the time it's in front of the Planning Commission. Okay, and I think we had, um, thank you for that. Um, we have uh, some minutes referred to a future agenda, and I think that is the only thing coming out of tonight's meeting. And um, with that, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>